parts of my job is when I get calls from homeowners who didn't do their due diligence up front, didn't understand what they were getting, they just, you know, selected, you know, a roofing contractor or a roofing system um, just off the fly, and now a short time after they've had their roof replaced at a very expensive cost, you know, they're faced with roofing problems. And I always tell people, you know, roofing is not like a, a pair of pants that you buy at Walmart. You know, you got home, they didn't fit right, or they had a loose string, and you take them back, you swap them out, and you get another one. I mean, you spend a lot of money for this roof, and if you make a bad decision, then you're stuck with it unless you want to pay that same amount of money out again to have it replaced. So when I have an opportunity to speak to a group of folks like yourselves, I, I mean, I count it all joy um, because I always say I'm going to fix the, the world, you know, one, one customer at a time. <laughs> Um, so, uh, as Michael had said, I'm the territory manager for West Central Florida. I've been in the roofing industry for about 18 years now, born and raised in Tampa, Florida. Uh, I have been on all sides of the roofing industry. I, I worked for a supplier, is where I started, and then I actually ran a roofing company for years, so I have that experience. And then for the last eight years, I've been uh, working for GAF. Uh, so, enough about me. So, what I'd like to do first of all, is just give you a little bit of information about what goes into a roofing system. Uh, because there's a lot of components, and as most of you here would recall, you know, there was a day when you bought a car and it was a base model, and then you decided to have air conditioning and power windows, and you added all these things, but we've all experienced this over time, that it's more beneficial and, and more friendly for us as consumers if we buy a system, because if there is an issue, then we're not having to, you know, get bounced around from one place to another or one product to another. Um, and again, I'm a consumer about, uh, I don't know, it's probably been about a year and a half now, my wife's computer crashed and I went to Best Buy and I bought her a new Hewlett Packard computer. And at the time, they had this big sign there that said, you know, printer sale. And her printer was kind of old and making noises, and I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll do that uh, as well, and we'll just get her a whole new setup. Well, I bought a Lexmark printer. Nothing against anybody, but when I got home and I plugged it in, the printer wouldn't work. So I called Lexmark, and you know how it is nowadays, you know, the prompt and, and hold, and you finally get to talk to a human being, and, and they said, well, you know, it's the HP software. That's the reason why the printer's not working. So I call HP, and you know this, you know the drill. You know, uh, four days later, uh, probably a cumulative of four hours of talking to people and pushing buttons, I finally got the thing to work. But it was just a very frustrating experience. So, whatever decision you make, whatever product you choose, I highly recommend that you go with a system that is all together from one manufacturer. You know, with that manufacturer's warranty. Because that puts you in a situation where if you were unfortunate to have a, a, you know, a roofing situation that you needed to call somebody, you know, it would be one call and you won't be put in that pointy finger situation. So when you look at a roofing system, these are the components that actually are going to go. Can everybody see that okay? Okay. So these are the components that are going into the system. Typically what the roofing contractor is going to do, he's going to tear the existing roof off down to the deck. Some people want to leave some stuff on there. I highly recommend that you remove it down to the deck. Nowadays, with the new building codes, they, they have to re-nail your deck if it's not nailed to code. So they have to use longer nails, ring shank nails, and they have to nail them closer together than they were uh, possibly at the time that these homes were built. So you want to have that clean deck going on. Once they've torn that clean deck off, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to put an underlayment on here. The underlayment is the, the primary uh, underlayment product that's going to go underneath your, your final roofing system. And there's a lot of different uh, variations of, these, of this category nowadays. Uh, does anybody here have any roofing experience? No? Okay. Just <laughs> replacing the roof. That's not a good experience. Um, underlayments. Uh, for years and years, the primary underlayment that they would put under uh, uh, like a typical shingle roof was called a felt. And basically what it was is an asphalt impregnated paper that they laid down there 
um, and it was intended to be a, a, um, a temporary water barrier so that if it rained between the time they tore your roof off and put the interlayment on and they put the shingles on, that you would have protection. But also, if you know you had a wind event and a shingle were to blow off, that you would have some kind of a, of a secondary protector there. What happened with that it, over the years is people realized, and, and you know, I, I don't, you have tile roofs, so I'm not sure if you would be able to see this, but if you tear off a roof and you saw a felt underlayment, it would literally be like a piece of paper that you stuck in an oven and baked it at 450 degrees. It would literally just like crumble into little pieces in your hand, okay? Because it's an asphalt product and it's very thin and over time it dries and gets brittle and it just wasn't a good secondary barrier. So over the years, the, uh, you know, some new underlayments came into the market which are called synthetics. Um, just to give you an idea, this would be a synthetic underlayment. You know, as you can see, it's not, it doesn't have any asphalt in it. It's got a rubber coating on the back side of it. And this is, you know, you, you can't tear this product. It's very, very rugged. Um, it's very light and it's white, which is cooler. Um, and if you were to have this product underneath, you're not going to have that drying out factor. And if you did have a shingle blow off, this would be a great secondary barrier to uh, keep water from getting into your house. I have, uh, I don't know if you want to, I have enough to share some of these if y'all want to. How is that secured to the roof? That is secured to the roof by nails. Um, and you can see that, you know, we even tell the installer where the, where the nail goes. If there's any couples or anything I could share, that would be, that would be great. lifts up then you're compromising your whole roof so we have a special sealant on that pro start starter that anchors down that that first course of shingles 
And not only is the sealant on the, on the uh, Pro Start starter, but it also is on the shingle. So you have a, a double seal there. We're so confident in that, in that uh, sealant that what we do is we give you a 20 mile an hour free wind warranty upgrade. So uh, other than a three tab, most of the laminated shingles or the architectural shingles uh, are warranted to 110 miles an hour. With the Pro Start starter, that would uh, up your wind warranty to 130 miles an hour, which is a category three hurricane. Um, so a very important component, you'll never see it. Other, other than you being out there while they're installing the roof, but so it's one of the most critical components of the roof. So you have the underlayment. Yes. And then you have this running right along the edge. Yes. Near the okay. I don't know if you can see this, I'll but I'll it. give these out in a little bit. Um, so this would be the synthetic, like what you have here, even though this is a it was blue at one point. I got you. <coughs> and then down here at the bottom. You see, that's where the starter strip goes. Okay, how wide is it? Not very um, wide. It's not very wide then from this point. No, no. Uh, it, the width of the starter is going to depend on the shingle that you put over the top of it. If you were to put a um, Monaco shingle on it, actually it's going to use another starter that we have that's called Weather Blocker. And the reason is that code requires that the starter. <laughs> starter come up further than the first course of exposure. So the, the weather blocker starter would be the one for the Monaco, like with a timberline shingle, it would be Pro Start. Um, we good? All right. Um, so again, a very critical compo uh, component. Now this next uh, item here is called a leak barrier. We have different forms of leak barriers, but this is the most popular one, and rather than add too much confusion, uh, I'll just show you that one there. And also, you can take one of those little samples. And now we're going to get into the area where there's a lot of confusion in the industries. And when homeowners get roofing estimates, you know, they get so many different variations from different roofing contractors that they don't know what to do. Leak barriers are, as you can see from that, they're a self adhered membrane. So you can peel this back off and you can feel how sticky that is, okay? Um, the advantage of a leak barrier and the intention for the design of the leak barrier is that a leak barrier seals through the nail. So when you put a nail through this leak barrier, I mean you can see we're in an air conditioned room and that's very sticky. When you put that on a hot roof, it's like chewing gum. So this was designed to go in the perimeters of your roof, in the valley, uh, hip and ridges, you know, anywhere where there's a change in the roof, this product was designed for that. Because roofs don't leak like in the middle of nowhere. You know, they're going to leak wherever there's a, a, a change in the pitch or wherever you have some kind of plumbing coming through the, the uh, roof. And the reason is that those areas of the roof are moving. We don't see them and we don't feel them, but they are moving. And this product here is also very flexible. So it can absorb the movement and seal around the nails where all your flashing is to, you know, prevent you from having leaks in those areas. So very important uh, product. However, here's the confusion. Over the years, the insurance companies have lobbied the roofing industry to um, put different types of underlayments to obviously reduce their liability. And at one point, they uh, had the code changed to where they wanted the, the whole roof covered with this leak barrier. Okay. Then the roofing industry kind of fought back because there's disadvantages of doing that and they kind of backed off on their position. But in today's world, you're going to have a, a bunch of roofers that are going to tell you to use this as your primary underlaying here. Okay? And they're going to tell you that you know, the insurance companies are going to give you a reduction in your insurance policy. And you know what? They're right. A lot of insurance companies are giving homeowners 
a reduction in their policy if you have a full deck application of that leak barrier. However, the discount attributable to the leak barrier is not as significant as the discount that you would get for having your deck renailed or having your trusses strapped to your vertical walls, to your block walls. Okay. Um, so there's a little bit of, you know, uh, I wouldn't say deception, but there's a little bit of confusion there. The problem with the full deck application of that leak barrier is that that sticks, one sticks to the other and it just totally seals off your, your deck. So now that plywood is not breathing. It really creates a vapor barrier between the inside of your attic and the outside. It's very important that you have air moving through your attic to do two things. One is to keep your attic cooler, help with your energy uh, you know, consumption, and also to uh, keep the, uh, the shingles laying on an environment that's not excessively hot. The other thing is critical in that ventilation equation is that you want to get moisture out of your house. You know, houses today are built a lot different than they were when I was a kid. You know, you had air coming in through the windows and the doors, and but now they put, you know, they put these wraps and everything is like super sealed. You know, moisture needs to get out. I mean, when you're taking a bath, you're boiling water, you're cooking, you know, that steam, that moisture's gotta go somewhere. It's gonna migrate to your attic, and having that ventilation going through your attic is gonna take that moisture out. So, very important. Um, so there's a lot of concern that putting a full deck application of that leak barrier is not going to allow that deck to breathe. And the shingles are going to uh, be living in an environment that's excessively hot, which will reduce the life of the shingle. And I really don't have quantitative information to tell you if it's you know, two years, if it's five years, because every house would be different. You know, if you have trees hanging over, if your house is pointing in this direction, that direction, you know, where's your major roof plane? There's too many things to really nail that down, but there's no doubt that excessive heat will reduce the life of the shingle. So, we prefer that you go with a underlayment that has more breathability to it, which would be like the tiger paw, and then that you would use the leak barrier in the perimeter, in the valleys and those roof transition areas to keep your roof from uh, having any issues with it. Any questions on that? So you put that leak barrier around any place where something comes up through the roof too? Yes. Okay. So whenever, wherever you have like your bathroom vent right. stacks or your dryer, uh, what they call goose decks, they kind of look like a question mark hanging out there. Uh, wherever those areas are, um, you would install a 24 inch square target around that. And you stick that down over the, the, uh, over the uh, lead boot flashing uh, and that way, when you nail that down, you know, you get, again, you get the sealability around the nails as well. Yes, sir? Both applications meet code, whether you did the whole roof or just those spots? Yes. Both applications meet code. And just so you know, we allow the full application of the leak barrier, but we caution that you're now putting the total vent, uh, the, the total ventilation responsibility from your uh, air coming in through your soffit and the air going out through your roof. Um, sometimes there's issues with that. I mean, a lot of uh, a lot of times nowadays, I run into homeowners who again are trying to you know make their homes as energy efficient as possible, and they'll have a, an insulation company come in and blow insulation. Well, these insulation co companies come in, and if they're not cautious. Excuse me. They'll blow insulation into your soffit. So this would be what your the real simplified version. Uh, this is your soffit right here, and these overhangs have little holes, you know, to allow air in, and then you're going to have some kind of. Uh, exhaust vent up here or maybe off the ridge that's going to allow air to come in through here um, and then exit you know through here 
well, the insulation companies come in and they blow insulation and they blow it all the way in here because it's not like it used to be where you had the rolled insulation where a little more controlled application. Now they just go in there with the big old holes and they blow it in there. And if they blow all that insulation in here, they blocked that roof's ability to take air in through your soffit. Mm -hmm. And if you can't let air in, you can't let air out. So that really destroys your, your whole ventilation equation. So we like the ability of that roof deck to be able to breathe through a nailable underlayment and for the shingles to live in a, in a uh, somewhat cooler uh, deck to get the maximum life out of the shingle. Do those uh, uh, roof uh, turbines work? Those? You know, those are pretty much almost extinct. Um, the problem with the turbines is over the years, you know, I mean, they're just, they're, they're very light and very fragile and either rust or dirt and whatever gets in it and they stop circulating. I mean, they, yeah. I um, don't see very many of those anymore. All right, what's it? They squeak. They, they squeak. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's, uh, we already kind of touched on the ventilation and the importance of it. Um, I unfortunately I was hoping to be able to see maybe a typical house in your neighborhood but it was dark and I wasn't able to do that um, so I'm not really sure if your homes have sufficient ridges um, to, to do ridge ventilation but this would be ridge ve ventilation right here at the peak that is the best place to exhaust your air because it's capturing all the air in your attic and moving it out to the highest point. A lot of times you see these vents that are off the ridge, but that leaves that portion of the roof unventilated. That's what you have, okay. Um, and, you know, for tile roofs it was more typical because the tile industry really didn't uh, come up with a ridge, a tile ridge vent product. Um, so it's very common if you had tile that you had an off-ridge vent. Um, I can tell you that I was running a roofing company during the hurricanes of 04 and 05 and I had 1,200 phone calls uh, with water coming in through those vents because of wind-driven rain. So I'm not a real big fan of them. They're kind of big and bulky and I would venture to say that if I went to any one of your homes and measured the square footage of the attic which is going to determine how much ventilation you need by code, that all your roofs are underventilated. Okay? Um, the uh, uh, Florida Roofing and Sheet Metal Association estimates that 90% of the homes in Florida are underventilated. Uh, so, uh, so if you have the sufficient ridge to do a ridge vent, then that would be the best place to uh, get that air out of your attic space. Again, we have several types of ridge vents, but I'm just going to give you the most popular one, and I'll tell you why it's the most popular one. Um, Cobra 3 is the, the vent product, the ridge vent product that we have that gives you most ventilation per linear foot. Now, it's also a very important component because, you know, if you drive around, I don't you know, I'm kind of weird because I'm in the roofing industry, so I always drive around looking at roofs, and my wife's like, keep your head on the roof. Um, but if you look around to shingle roofs, a lot of times what you'll see is like an aluminum ridge vent. And the reason they have aluminum ridge vent is because the roofer didn't explain to them what the difference was between a good vent and a bad vent. Because the aluminum ridge vents are very problematic, and I can tell you that from experience because the house I live in today, when I bought it, um, they had had problems with their ridge vent and had to replace all the cathedral ceilings in the house. The reason is that the aluminum ridge vent has an exposed fastener. So the way it's mounted onto your roof, that fastener is exposed to the elements. And the roofers will tell you that they put their caulk in whatever their little roofing solution is, everyone has a different one. But in Florida, when you get the heat and the climate that we have, that will just be a matter of a couple of years before that concoction dries and cracks, and then you start having problems with those, with those uh, ridge vents. Uh, the other thing is they're kind of tall, they're aluminum, they only come in four colors, 
and they really never match your roof. They, they, they always kind of just stick out. Um, so I'm not a fan of those because, again, I've experienced that, that problem myself. So with this Cobra 3 ridge vent, it's what we call a shingle over ridge vent. So that, that vent is going to be nailed down onto your ridge, and then another shingle is going to be nailed on top of it. So all the fasteners that are used to fasten the vent to the roof are covered with shingles. And those shingles match the shingles on your, on your roof. So they really blend in. When it's all said and done, you would almost not know that they're there. I mean, you, you're just going to see the little area, the little black area where, you know, where the air comes in and out. Uh, but it's very effective, uh, much more effective than these uh, four-foot off-ridge vents, and aesthetically just, you know, uh, more pleasing. So with that, we're going to get into your hip and ridge. Are you familiar with, with that term? Um, obviously the ridge is going to be the, the, the peak of your house. But nowadays, ever since uh, Hurricane Andrew, the construction in Florida has really changed to a hip roof. So, uh, let's see if I can do that. Uh, Can you see that? Mm -hmm. This would be considered a gable. Nowadays, it's very unlikely that you see a lot of gable construction in homes uh, because that created a lot of problems during hurricanes and high wind events. So nowadays, they, the roofs, instead of being like this, they actually have you know, a roofing plane coming down. So I don't know if you can see that area right there. That would be a hip. And then this would be a ridge. So whenever you have uh, hips or ridges, you're going to need to put a hip and ridge shingle cap over it. It's the same cap that's going to go over that Cobra 3 shingle over vent. Again, here's where, you know, where we get into a little bit of trouble because roofing, you know, one thing you'll find is I'm going to give you the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Roofing is not a very esteemed industry, okay? If you call the Better Business Bureau, it's probably like number two or number three in most complaints. And the reason is that it's not a very regulated industry. So it, it's not self-regulating. So literally, you know, you can go and buy a ladder at Home Depot and buy some shingles and go and install a roof on somebody's house. And you're supposed to be licensed, but if nobody caught you, um, you know, nobody would know the difference. Um, so there's a lot of roofers that are just looking to give you the cheapest bid that they can give you and give you the cheapest products that they can find uh, just to get your business. And you being a consumer that's not, you know, um, educated on roofs, I mean, let's face it, how many, how many roofs have you bought in your lifetime? <laughs> you know, I think I bought one so far. I probably have to buy another one, but it's not something that we buy a lot or that we're very familiar with. And the interval between the time that you bought your first one and you bought the second one, if you did buy a second one, the, the standards have changed so much that, you know, everything is, is going to be different. So, um, so it's very important, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, you know, about selecting the, the right contractor. But a lot of contractors, what they'll do is they'll take a three-tab shingle, which is a, a flat shingle and they'll cut it and form it into a hip and ridge shingle. The problem is this, you got the shingles, you got the pro start starter, you have 130 mile an hour wind warranty on your shingles and then you're going to put that three tab shingle on there as a hip and ridge which has a 60 mile an hour wind warranty. It just doesn't make sense. And when you look at the cost difference, I mean on a, on a typical house, the difference between using the right hip and ridge shingle and using a cut up three tab you know, it's probably going to be, you know, probably a, hundred, a couple hundred bucks, okay? Um, when you start looking at the kind of money you're going to put in replacing your roof, and you start taking those shortcuts, you're really putting yourself in a, in a position of high risk. Um, so, what we have, and I, I realized uh, after I set all my stuff out here, we have two shingles that are designed for the hip and ridge. That one is uh, Sealer Ridge, and before I leave, I'll bring you the other one, which is called Timber Tex. 
both approved, but here's the difference. Sealer Ridge is a one-ply shingle, and it has a 90 mile an hour wind warranty. Timber Tex is a two-ply shingle, uh, so it's got much higher vertical dimension, and it's a 130 mile an hour wind warranty. So with the Timber Tex, you're going to get the full 130 on your whole roofing system. And again, for the difference in price, uh, I would highly recommend it. Um, the the uh, Timber Tex also does another thing, is that the Timber Tex, being that it's two plies, it gives that your hips and ridges a lot more dimension and a lot more look. And the way I like to relate to it is that when you look at that, the, the uh, intersection between your ceiling and the wall, you know, it's nice. Nice paint job, nice detail. But if you put crown molding on it, it would, it would create the wow factor. Okay? Uh, timber Tech is going to create that wow factor uh, for the roof. Any questions on that? Um, after you install all these, which we call accessories, then you're going to actually get into the shingles. Um, we have a very extensive line of shingles. Uh, what I brought for you here is called Monaco. And Monaco is a shingle that is actually uh, designed to simulate a uh, barrel tile roof. We also have shingles that look more like a flat tile roof. So we do have a lot of options, but I brought this here for you to see. It's, uh, it, it's really crazy. Um, let me borrow yours for just a second. This house right here is actually in Tampa, in Meadow Point. That was one of the first prototypes that we did. And it just has a, an uncanny ability to, um, you know, play on your eyes. I mean, it really is an optical illusion because as you can see, the shingles are flat. But when you put them up on a roof and you look at them, uh, and, and I'll be quick to tell you that, you know, as with many shingles, <coughs> excuse me, the pitch of your roof is important to how that roof looks. Like some people want to spend crazy money and get these like super fancy designer shingles and they have a roof that's almost flush. Okay, I always tell them, don't waste your money on a big expensive <coughs> shingle because if your roof is at an angle like this, all you're going to see is the butt edge of it. You know, you're really not going to enjoy the aesthetic beauty of the design of the shingle. So, pitches are very important. Monaco probably showcases best between a 5 and a 8 to 9 12, which is pretty common in Florida. Um, again, I don't, I'm not sure what pitches you guys have on your roof. They're pretty strong. Are they pretty strong? Yeah. Um, so, Monaco, Monaco is, a, is a great way to get the, 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 the look of tile without, you know, reinstalling the tile roof. And, and while I'm on that subject, I want to uh, kind of explain a little bit on what Michael was talking about earlier. Um, the amount of homeowners that are switching from tile to shingles is just astronomical. Uh, and I'm not here to put down the tile industry uh, because I don't think that it's necessarily their fault. But with a tile roof, you have to have a different underlayment system than this. And again, roofers were putting down, you know, builders didn't want to pay a lot for roofing and they were kind of forcing the roofers to put down as least expensive system as they could and those systems that are underneath the tile is what's actually failing, okay? I mean, tile, when you come right down to it, uh, in, in, you know, tile that's made in the United States isn't a water um, protector for your house. It's not your, your primary water protector, okay? It's the underlayment that's protecting you your, from water from getting in your house. The tile is strictly aesthetic, uh, and some people will, uh, will arguably say that it might create a little bit of insulation if you have a barrel tile because you have that air gap between the underlayment and the tile. Uh, but tile doesn't have a waterproofing uh, capability. And really, tile, for years, I don't know if you ever heard this, but people would say, oh yeah, my tile roof's got a 50-year warranty. 
Well, you really got to read those warranties because if you rent a PAL warranty, what you would find is that the only thing that they guarantee for 50 years is that it will be a cement product 50 years from now. They don't warranty the finish, the color, fading, um, anything. What they basically say is that if you put this concrete tile here and you don't hit it, you don't hammer it, you don't hit it with a golf ball, and you don't run over it, that 50 years from now, it'll still be there. Well, we know that. I mean, you know, I could go get a bag of cement at Home Depot and, and lay a glob down there, and if nobody touches it 50 years, it'll still be there. So it wasn't a, a, um, it wasn't a warranty that really was a system warranty, and it really didn't dictate the proper underlayments. So everybody had a free-for-all, they put cheap underlayments down there, and it's really sad because people that thought they had a 50-year roof are replacing tile roofs after 10 years. Um, so, um, you know, the, the shingle products, uh, especially with today's technology, is a much more user-friendly. Uh, how many of you actually get up and walk on your tile roof? You know, uh, if you have leaves or you got to blow leaves out of your valley or something, or, um, you know, it's always a problem. And if you hired somebody to get up on your tile roof, it's very common for them to break tiles as they're walking on your roof because you really have to know how to walk on the, on the top in order not to break it. So you hire a guy to clean your roof, he goes out, he breaks the tile, when the tile breaks it digs into the underlayment, it cuts a hole, you know, now you've got problems and you think that the guy that cleaned your roof, uh, you know, is at fault. So it, it's not a very homeowner friendly product. Yes, Michael? On that point, Rick, um, with the tile roofs, uh, and in our subdivision, it's not that bad, but I see a lot of them are kind of dirty, and they have to be pressure washed every couple of years to stay clean and attractive, and then people walk on them and break tiles and so forth. It's an ongoing problem. What's the situation with shingle roofs in, in terms of uh, having to clean them and people walking on them and causing damage? And how does that compare to the tile roof situation? Um, good question. Um, shingle roofs, as far as walking on them, there, there's no friendlier product to have on your roof than a shingle roof. You can get up and walk on that and, you know, you can dance up there. I mean, it's not going to damage the shingle. I shouldn't say that. Uh, maybe, not, maybe not. As long as you don't do the twist, <laughs> um, you'd be okay. But, um, yeah, it's a very, very user-friendly uh, product, you know. I, I go up on my roof and I blow my gutters out and, you know,